Well, welcome, Art, to the American Innovator. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's fun to be back in the air with you because we had a great time last time. Yeah, we did. I left you some homework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, have, you have one amazing memory, too, don't you? <laughs> so we're down to 10 minutes. We're not we're not exactly where a Celti is, your company in Belgium, but yep. uh, we changed the dyes out so fluidly, it's unbelievable. It's so easy for us to do now. But we didn't, right. we didn't use rollers yet. We didn't invest in that. And uh, you know, the listeners are probably wondering what we're talking about. Uh, we have injection molding, and Art's an injection molding expert, and he challenged me to get my uh, dye changes down to under 10 minutes SMED. And we haven't got it quite to under 10 minutes, but right at 10 minutes. We change dyes out all the time, just like it's a piece of cake. We don't even think anything about it. We do everything just in time. So, Art, we thank you for that. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear that you yeah. did it. And about 10 other areas as well. We accomplished two hours fax to truck from the time that we get an order to the time we make it, package it, and put it in the truck is two hours. That's great. Better than the guy with the six-week lead time, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the biggest problem we have is a customer calling after about a half hour they place the order and they call and say we want to change the order we say the order's already gone <laughs> 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 that's our biggest problem that's the kind of problems you want right yep okay so for our listeners i have a couple mentors in my life who have just had a profound impact on me one is mr amazawa former president of georgetown kentucky and uh, Richie Oshingo, son of uh, Shigeo Shingo, uh, used to be the president and opened up the operations in Toyota China. And these two men have had a profound impact on me, but I have to say that Art is the third one that has had a huge impact on me and my thinking and the effortlessness he seems to uh, do these turnarounds in his company. It's just absolutely profound. And Art, I appreciate all you've taught me and your mentorship and uh, just the way you make everything look so easy. Well, thanks for the nice comment. Yeah, and on top of that, what what experience you have for you know how many years? How many years have you been doing turnarounds now? 30, 40 years, maybe. Yeah, about about thirty. I started in uh, nineteen eighty two. Yeah. Wow. Could anybody have more experience than you in the real world stuff? So it's just awesome. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. A lot of a lot of interesting things have happened. Yeah, absolutely. So your first book, the Lean Turnaround, and now the Lean Turnaround Action Guide. The Lean Turnaround. Around, I wrote, you know, three or four years ago, just because I was watching the lean movement uh, as it progressed, and I, I was kind of discouraged because it seemed like there weren't very many companies being successful. And I thought the reason for that was that because most of them were focusing on lean as a bunch of tools. I decided that, you know, I've been doing this the same way for a long, long time. It's always been successful. So I decided to write a book about lean as a strategy and, and something that you use to run your business, not as some cost-cutting thing. Right. And so that that was what created the lean turnaround. And then that turned out to be fairly successful. So I thought thought I was retired from book writing after that one. Um, I wasn't planning any more books, but McGraw-Hill came back to me and said, gee, you know, we really liked the, the first one. It was very popular. We'd like you to write another one, but we'd like it to be more more detailed, like a field book kind of thing. And so I said, okay, I'll do that. And I wasn't sure how to go about that because uh, I didn't really want to write a, a kind of tools book or anything. Then we come up with the idea of, well, why don't we just buy a company, create a company, buy it, and then turn it around and, and take people through all the steps that I would take someone through in real life to turn a company around. And so that's what we did. We created a company called United Gear and Housing Corporation, or mm -hmm. for short, UG. Created a management team and and then created a, a five-year forecast as a batch company. Then we went through and talked with the management team, talked with all the people, did the initial training that we needed to do, started the Kaizen work, and then we tracked the company for the first five years under Lean. And then we kind of compared the results. We compared the results financially, and then we compared the results in terms of what happened to people and what happened to the ch change in the management style. It was kind of a fun book to write because, you know, with the management team, by creating a management team, then you could have a dialogue back and forth all the time so they could come back and say, well, you've got to be kidding. We can't do that. We're not, right. Our company can't do that. Um, or to just when you give them the challenges as to what you'd like them to do and what expectations you have. And they, they've been, you know, I, I purposely created a company that was doing fairly well. So, okay. Art, at the end of the day, you want people to figure out lean is completely doable and dramatic results can occur. But yet you say in the book that really only about maybe 4% of the people that do this actually have the kind of results that you're talking about. It's, you know, no one has exact statistics on that. 
maybe it's a little bit higher, but it's not much higher. And, you know, when I talk, talk to the different lean consultants and people that are working on this every day, they kind of confirm those kind of numbers. That's kind of what they see. I agree. And I think the reason is, is that most people start out with the wrong idea. They think of this as a cost reduction item. The chapters in the book, that, that one is a chapter on setup reduction, one is a chapter on flow, one is a chapter on an office Kaizen for inside sales. Yeah. takes you through each one of those and uh, how did we make the changes? What were the objections? What was going on during right. that? But, you know, at the end, for example, in the in the flow Kaizen, when they create flow, we went from 10 people down to five with a very clear path to getting to from 10 to four. And we cut the lead time from six weeks down to two days and we improved the quality by 10 times. If you did a Kaizen like that in most companies, what they would grab onto, and the only thing that would be important to them was they went from 10 people down to five. That's but, not the strategic. nobody this, loses their job. You can't lose your job doing that because no one will help you again. <laughs> if you right. want to try it again, but more you importantly, won't get what do you What do you do with all the people now that you've, you're so efficient? Well, you have lots of options. You know, you can stop, stop working overtime. You, you can move the people into different functions. And I think the biggest question is, let's say I, go, I have Kaizen Week and I go from 10 people down to five. And let's say that you're the manager whose department we did this in. Right. And now I say, okay, take the five people out that we that we freed up and I want to put them someplace else. Well, you're going to give me the worst five people that you have right. if, if it's up, up to you. The, the lean company is going to go the opposite way. What you really want to do is take the five best people out. Right. And if you take the five best people out, hopefully you can promote a couple of them into to a better role and advertise that in the company and say, hey, we did this Kaizen and two people got promoted out of five. If you take the best people out and then one day you, you have somebody's out sick, I've got five people in the in the factory someplace else that know how to come right back in and sure, do that job. Sure. So we're very good at it. To balance the load. Two, balance the load. Number two, it's going to force the people that are left to step it up, right? Right. They're going to have to step up. They're going to have to get better. We, we gave them a different process. We gave them a better process. It should be easier, but they're going to have to step up. And so, again, you're trying to grow your people. You're trying to help them learn. You take out the best people. You're forcing the, the people that are left to come up. You've got, you got chances to promote them. If in doubt, you can always put them in the just-in-time office for, for a period of time and let your help make improvements. I've never seen a problem with that. Yeah, but I think at the end of the day, Art, I think when you have those people freed up, they really have the opportunity now to look for other ways to add more value for your customers. Then the, cus the company becomes more valuable because it's more responsive in the innovative right. solutions that it comes up with for the customer. That's the way it works in my company. I mean, I, we never think about anyone losing their job. Everyone just gets to go into a new value-added activity of creativity, innovation, experimentation, whatever it is. Which, right. all, which ultimately makes our company more attractive to our customers. Right. Exactly what happens. It's exactly what happens. That's what and, I see it. You know, if, as, you, as you remove the waste and get more efficient and better quality and show the lead times and all those things, what's going to happen is you're going to need every one of those people because your company is going to grow. Exactly. Gonna, There's the answer. Gonna, right? The company is going to grow. If you become that much more efficient and your people are that much more thoughtful, the company is going to grow. Absolutely. That's what, exactly there, what's going to happen. And we always thought of it as, you know, what we're trying to do is to, we're not trying to cut the people in half. We're trying to keep the same people and double the sales, you know? And, <laughs> I love it. And make you, it too simple, Art. Come on. It can't oh, be that simple. I told you at the beginning, you got to make it simple or you're going to get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> it, it's simple, but it requires some hard work. You have to you have to fundamentally change the way you look at everything. It's, it's an interesting thing. Way back in, this is 1987 or so, we first started doing Kaizen with the Shinju Jitsu team at, at Jake Break. And the, I was the group executive, and the guy that ran Jake Break was a guy named George Konensaker, who's a very smart guy. And... The two of us sat down, and we were the only two people in Danaher that had any, any ex prior experience with Lean at all at that point. Of course, it wasn't called Lean at that time. It was called uh, the Toyota Production System right. or Just in Time. But we just said, look, one, one day we were at lunch, and we said, look, whatever the Japanese tell us to do, we're going to do it, even if we think it's the stupidest thing we've uh, ever heard. Uh, and I would say that probably about half of the time, we uh, thought it was the stupidest thing we right, ever heard. Right. But we, we did it anyway, every time, and... The other thing was we never let it go backwards because a lot of times when we, when we put a new configuration in place, it, it really didn't work. But we said, okay, they did it for a reason. We kind of understand the reason. Now we got to figure out the problems and make it work. We, right. Because most people, you know, most people say, well, you know, you tried this and it didn't work. Let's go back the other way. And we said, no, no, no. You never get to go back. We're never <laughs> going to never allow you to go And we wow. just we spent, the, spent the time trying to fix the problems. And, and once you fix them, then boom, things would just take off. You know, I think. I think Jake Brake uh, experienced yeah. something like a 29% productivity gain 
measured in number of uh, breaks per man hour over the fr- like first five years that we were doing this. It was an incredible yeah. percentage for quite a long time that we were getting because everybody was participating well, and everybody was working on this stuff. Well, here's what I'd say. So your next book, I know you don't want to write more books. You were done with the first book and here you're on your second book. The next book is How High oh, I'm is Up. I'm done. I'm done writing books. <laughs> no, no, no. How, Art Burn, How High is Up, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is just a great, that is a great concept because people just have no clue what is possible right you know it's it's kind of like you know when we first started going to see toyota and we would be in the toyota factory and say well what do you what are your inventory turns? Because inventory turns was a big focus of ours. They look at you funny and they didn't understand the question because they didn't think of it as inventory turns. They thought of it as how many days of inventory on hand do I have? And their answer was, we're really bad right now. We're supposed to have only a half a day and we have like 0. 0.6 days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's like, oh, gee, a half a day? You know, this massive factory and there's only a half a day of inventory total. And But when you go there, you can see it. The stuff's coming in and going back I, out. I've and, seen engines come in every seven minutes. Every yeah. seven minutes, a truck arrives. Eight engines come off the truck. Truck yeah. pulls out through a high-speed door. Next truck pulls in. Seven more engines come off. They go right on the assembly line, whether it be tires stacked up perfectly in order for every car. Every car is a different car, a different model, and the cars and the and the tires just come in just in time. It's just like this we we had a, when I was at Warmo, we had a relationship with a company that made gasoline tanks. Uh, a lot of them for the Corolla car, and and this. You know, it's a big metal stamping plant because the gas tank's a pretty big thing and it's, it takes a big presses to do it. And when you went down to the the assembly area, they didn't know know what was going to come next. They only got four gas tanks at a time. Toyota would would send over the, the order for the next four gas tanks, then the next four gas tanks at a regular interval. But but they never knew which ones they were going to be. Right. And they would make they would make them, they would assemble them, and they would put them on this uh, this uh, trailer, and the trailer would then be dragged over to the Toyota factory. And then the Kanban cards in their system would go backwards and tell them what to make next, right? So everything was on a pull of the next four gas tanks from Toyota. Well, the next year, we went to the Toyota factory to see the gas tanks being installed. Well, what they did is they just pulled this trailer up next to the line. Yeah, sure. And, and, and a robot, there was no people there. A robot would pick the, the gas tank off and fit it in the car. And just to make it more complicated, the, the taxis in Japan use a uh, uh, LPG gas or something like that. They don't use gas, regular right. gasoline. So they have a completely different tank. So they would have to skip a couple of cars when a taxi taxi model was coming down. But, wow. you know, and if, if they got this wrong or if this trailer didn't get to Toyota in the next, in the time frame, and it was like, it was about a 45 minute drive over to the Corolla factory, the whole, the whole Corolla factory would shut down. And yet everything was going on the next four gas tanks. Here's the next four, here's the next four, here's the next four. And it worked smooth as could be. It was the smoothest yeah, you know, thing you ever saw. I was one time in the um, brake manufacturing plant for Toyota. It wasn't Toyota, but it was a brake, the people that made the brakes for Toyota. And I asked the guy, and I have this on video. It's a fantastic video. And I said to the guy, I said, have you ever stopped a Toyota line? And he paused and he said, 11 years ago, there was a snowstorm and all the okay. roads were shut down. But we rented a helicopter. No, we've never stopped one. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very bad for your business. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Yeah. It's a different but, way. It's a different way of thinking completely. That's the whole thing. And it's a completely different way of thinking. Yeah. And if you can't get yourself to that point of view, yeah. it's pretty hard. You know, it's like I was saying before, if if you did a Kaizen and you went from ten people to five people, but you also cut the lead time from six weeks to two days and, and the quality went up by ten. People would just say, "Oh, that was a great kaizen. We saved five people." They wouldn't. They wouldn't understand the strategic aspect of going from six week lead time to two days. They, they would just go right over their head. They would, it would just pass them right by. Okay, so your next book is "How High Is Up," and then the book after that is "The Psychology of the Effective Lean Leader." We need to know how Art Burn thinks. We need to understand how people like you think. What is going on in your head? that this just seems so simple and so obvious and so many people, 96% of the people out there just can't get their head around this. It, yeah. we, we've got to crack that code. Yeah, I agree. It's difficult. That's why that's the only reason I wrote the two books in the first place yeah. was to try and, try and put it in the terms of a business, not in terms of a bunch of tools. You know, 
we don't need another book on how to do Kanban or how to do, uh, you know, pokey okey or something like that. You know, you know, there's all kinds of things like that. But people, that's what people think of it. They think it's a bunch of tools. They don't understand that it's a strategy and a business approach to how to run your business and how to deliver more value to the customer. So back when you first started and you said you implemented a Kanban the first time, you know, for me, what caused me to do the Toyota production system was I was tired of struggling. I just wanted things to go smoothly. I was tired of chasing my tail. And when I found out there was a way that I didn't have to chase my tail and things could go smoothly, I just said, I'm all in. I'm not even, this is, I'm like, I'm, yeah. whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. What was yeah. it for you? What caused you to say, I'm in? Well, it was the same kind of thing. I mean, we, this was back when I first general manager job at General Electric. I was in the lighting business. And we, the lighting business group was a pretty big group in GE. And we had product companies that made the final bulbs. And then we had component companies that made the parts that went into the bulbs, you know, the bases and the filaments and all that kind of stuff. So we decided that we were going to have a Kanban between my company. I was making all the outdoor bulbs, uh, metal halide, those kind of big bulbs that you see on the street lights or you see in a high bay factory. And so the guy that was making the arc tubes for me, uh, he was about 45 minutes away drive. And we decided to just create this Kanban truck. And every day he would come in the morning and we'd give him the can bands from the arc tubes that we used the day before. That was the whole thing we did, there was nothing else. My inventory went from, from 40 days down to three, and he completely eliminated his inventory. So probably for the lighting business group, I bet we went from 100 days down to three days. That was interesting because at that time in GE, no one cared about that. No one cared about inventory right. reduction. They, they were, you know, make the month or die. Right. And, and so short no one really short cared. Short-term thinking. What we noticed was, gee, the inventory drop, but what would happen was the quality got better, productivity got better, we freed, up down. Lot, you know, we freed up a lot of space, our people were happier, um, all kinds of good things like that. And I said, gee, if it was just this Kanban can create all these wonderful side effects, I got to learn more about this. I got to do this more. And so when I left GE and went to Danaher, we started doing this, myself and Conan Saker. Then we had created a few cells and some things. We, they weren't very good cells, but we had some. And then we ran into Shin Jiu-Jitsu. And we, we, they, they didn't have any customers in the U.S., and we begged them to come and consult for us. And at first they said, yeah, we're too old, we don't speak English, it's too far away, blah, right, blah, blah. Right. And so we said, yeah, but we have steak, and we yeah, have yeah, lobster, yeah, 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 and, we, yeah. and we have golf, we have lots of golf, and they love golf. So, <laughs> so they finally thought about it, and they said, okay, we'll come and work with you. And, and, and then, of course, they, they taught us everything. I mean, it was unbelievable to You're watch so what they were practical, were. Art. Come on. It can't be that's <laughs> practical. Steak it was. And lobster and golf? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. We, I took him. I said, look, for golf, I'm going to take you down to this, this golf place, mm -hmm. big golf store. I'm going to buy you each a set of clubs, and I'll keep them in my office so when you're here and you want to play, yeah. you have your own, your own clubs, and you can't complain about clubs, you know, right, so because right. they, were, they were pretty competitive. And so anyway, we take them down. We get out of the car, and the, and the sign up above on the store says, Golfer's Warehouse. Ooh, and this, uh, yeah, a water gets out of the car and he looks up and he goes, Oh, warehouse. I hate warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I think you might like this warehouse. <laughs> they, they, they were in there for like three hours, hitting balls into the net, testing out every club. I couldn't get them out of there. Oh, so, that's great. That's a great story. I hate so, warehouse uh, inventory. Uh, <laughs> I hate warehouse. <laughs> This might be the only warehouse that you ever like. Oh, what a great story. Well, Art, thank you so much. What an awesome book. What a great contribution you've made to the Lean Society and culture and of learning and, and making it fun and easy. And I just appreciate you so much. And what you've done for me with a Celtie and going to Belgium. I took my team. Art offered to let my team go to Belgium for two days and we worked with your people. And it was unbelievable. Yeah, those guys have done a good job. That's uh, just for the for the listeners. You know, this is a injection molding factory where we started out. These are big injection molding machines, four hundred and fifty yeah. times yeah. the bigger, and and they were five hours to change over. Now they can do it in five minutes. Breathtaking! It, it, everything was breathtaking. Your guys, Mark was awesome. Yeah, oh, yeah. he's very good. Oh, it was just the best time. Oh, we had a great time. I can tell you some funny stories that we did there in the evening, but we won't go into that this time. <laughs> but I, we, I, I heard those stories, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> the boot? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Well, thank you, Art. You're awesome. Everyone run out and get this book and enjoy every second of it because Lean is so much fun, and it really makes such a big difference. And Art, great job. Thank you.
All right. Thank you very much. Take care, Paul. My Good luck. Pleasure. Have fun in Japan. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. See ya.